Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for November the 27th, 2020. This is episode number 34. Today, we'll be talking about range. Specifically, the Tesla Model S gets another range boost. The Ford Mustang Mach-E EPA range has been revealed, and Tesla is semi to get 621 miles of range. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge with Tom Malogny. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Outer Spec Motoring family of YouTube channels. He also puts together the superb videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. I guess we were on the, we're having this is our Thanksgiving weekend show, and um, so we're taking a little bit more relaxed approach today, mostly because I, I managed to erase all of my notes beforehand, uh, just beforehand. So we're, uh, you know, we're, uh, yeah, we're just off the cuff here today. So usually we start off with talking about what we've driven this week, and I understand that, Kyle, you have driven something uh, highly anticipated, and uh, we're all dying to hear about it. Tell us what you can about the... Ford Mustang Mach-E. Yeah, a couple interesting this uh, cars this week, things going on. Uh, one of them, of course, is the Mustang Mach-E. Um, you know, I, I, Ford's been doing these, these press drive events where they rotate the media through, and I think they're like four-hour blocks. You show up, they give you a, you know, a presentation around the car, they show you how their app works, and then they let you drive around a parking lot for... 10, 15 minutes, and then they send you out on the street for a little while. And while I certainly was excited to take advantage of that opportunity, um, I actually, uh, time in, my videographer and I, we missed our flight on the way to uh, the event. We had totally fine, dry morning here at, you know, we left the house at 3.45, 4 a.m., get down closer to Denver, it's an hour drive to the airport, and all of a sudden, huge whiteout, blizzard, can't do more than like 30 miles an hour, no grip, and we just completely missed our flight by about 60 seconds. We're running in the airport. Oh. So, uh, you know, we talked to Ford, they're awesome, awesome people over there, and they said, look, we'll make it We'll make it cool, don't worry, just just let us know when you land in Detroit to get on the next flight, basically, and, um, and, and we'll totally sort it out. So what we ended up doing was, uh, we flew in, we landed at night, like it took all day to get there. Our plane was delayed because of snow at that point, and it was just really a mess. So um, uh, Mark Kaufman at Ford, who's an awesome guy, and I believe one of the the real heads of electrification in the company, came over to our hotel with his Mustang Mach-E and showed us all around the vehicle, which was awesome. And I had known Mark uh, from our simulator drive back in North Carolina, so it was great to see him again. It was great to see his personal Mustang Mach-E that he you know, took the time out of his day to show us around really nice, You know, took us through the Ford Pass app, took us through the Sync 4A system. Uh, everything was, was really a, a great presentation. And then uh, we went to bed, and then we woke up at 6.45 in the morning, uh, with a Mustang Mach-E parked right out in front of the hotel, nice. which was awesome. And uh, we had it until 5 p.m. that same day. So we did a lot of tests. Unfortunately, I can't share any information about impressions, about oh. how the car drove oh. up until December 15th. Which oh, is you're Saturday. killing me. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, but I can tell you what I did with the car because I can't tell you if it was good or bad. Sure. Uh, it, I, uh, let's see, we got in the car, we did like a first driving uh, impressions video. So you'll see our raw impressions the first time we got in the car, uh, you know, from acceleration, cornering, braking performance. We um, tested the uh, driver assistance system, Copilot 360. We went pretty in depth with that system. Uh, we talked about some of the hands-free features that will be coming in mid-2021. Uh, the car that we drove had the prep package. So you can see the little infrared sensors on the camera. We don't see them with your own eyes. And then um, what else did we do? I did a, a uh, DC fast charging test okay. at an Electrify America station. And then we did a uh, just nope. city driving, highway driving, and performance driving analysis of the vehicle. 
And that's and that basically took us all the way through the end of the day. Tons of videos coming on inside EVs and out of spec reviews about the Mustang Mach E on December fifteenth, and some walk arounds coming today or tomorrow, as soon as I can get them edited, because I can do and I can say anything about the car. Okay. Uh, as long as it doesn't have to do with driving impressions. Okay. Um. So Kyle, I have a quick question. Do you know if it was production uh, software, like if the uh, if they had the final version of the software in there? Because I know I've done press drives before, you know, even a month before the vehicle is going to launch. And they tell me, well, just so you know, this isn't production software. We're still tweaking a few things. So things like charge rate isn't always exactly where it's going to be at production. For some reason, they'll have it throttled back or something. Did you confirm that you had production software in the vehicle? Yeah, uh, bits and pieces of it were still getting minor tweaks, but for the most part, um, I, it's pretty much ready, uh, ready to rock and roll. I mean, the cars, the the car I drove rolled off the production line. Uh, it right. wasn't off of a hand built special pre production thing. Of course, they'll have software tweaks over time. It has over the air software updates to every module, and they claim they will do this in in actually pretty high frequency, uh, which is which is good, I think, yeah. and. Um, yeah, I, Tom, I, it's hard to say what will change between the car I drove and the production version. I had asked them this, and it's, I think, just a lot of back-end minor tweaks. Um, and, and who knows, maybe even the first cars will be delivered on the software on the car I drove, and they'll just come over the air. We, we really don't know for sure, but it's something I can go back to the team and ask. And you had no problems with the Elect Electrify America charging? Can't talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so this is like I said, it's a highly anticipated car. Uh, can you say whether it deserves to be highly anticipated? Can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is like such a good game of what can we ask Kyle and, and what can't he say? Uh, what color was it? Uh, grabber blue. I specifically, and yeah. we can talk about that, and I can post a time and shot a beautiful gallery of photos. We'll have them up later today sure. of the bright blue Mustang Mach E. Uh, you know, contrasting the gray, snowy skies of Detroit uh, with, uh, I shot one picture of it in front of the GM Tower, which was kind of mean, but also <laughs> kind of funny. And, uh, you know, it was kind of the same, though. The grabber blue of the car was kind of similar to the trim of the uh, GM sign and building there. Yeah. Martin, can you go over to my Twitter? And I posted a couple pictures of the car. Yeah. Uh, I love, love, love this color. And I think I can say this because this isn't driving impressions. Driving it around downtown Detroit and just stopping, you know, Detroit's pretty much dead right now. There's nothing going on. COVID's right. really bad. So, so the, it's empty, right? So right. we're like parking the car in the middle of the streets and taking pictures of it and getting beautiful shots and, of course, not impacting any traffic, right? But everyone walking by, does not matter there, it, it, you know, it could be anyone from a very well-dressed businessman to really anyone other than that loved this car. I mean, these smiles on the faces of Detroit were huge. You drive down the highway, everyone's breaking their neck looking at this car. Uh, and I, I think this is important to yeah. say, though, because Motor City, this is the home of American car culture right here. And the fact that the residents of that city, the heart of Detroit, loved every single one of them had positive reactions to the Mustang Mach-E is, is a great thing for the future of electric vehicles in that city. Uh, and that means a lot for, for the whole country. So I was super pleased with that. You know, we went through the drive through We kind of forgot to eat all day because we were working so hard and we're like, we pull up to the McDonald's drive through and the dude's like, no way, that's the new Mustang. It's so cool. Oh, nice. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really a very positive outward reaction to the vehicle more so then you would get driving, you know, at least around here, it's similar to if you drove a, a Ferrari, you know, 430 around, people would look at you. It's, this is like the Ferrari over there. I, I was very impressed with that reaction from everyone. D Detroit and, Ferrari. And it's interesting. Uh, if, if you remember when, when I did the ID4 drive, we talked about how um, I drove it around the streets of New York City and how nobody even gave it a look. Because right. like it's <laughs> the, the different approach that these two vehicles have, and they're kind of in the same class, not exactly because this is more of a performance oriented uh, crossover, but they're going to have, there's some overlap and competition in these two cars, price, utility, sure. size, and so forth range. And um, uh, like 
that's Volks, what Volkswagen accomplished what they wanted to accomplish with that car. It just to be like to blend in with everything else, to do everything well, to be a good family hauler, very utilitarian. And it seems like Ford has accomplished what they wanted to do with the Mach-E, you know, to come out and say, bang, like we're here. This is our, this is performance. This is electrified. You know, you know, th this is the future of Ford. So it's really good to hear that that people were reacting to it like that, Kyle. That's really cool. And one thing on a side note, seeing this color now is, has got me really tweaked because, yeah, as as we mentioned earlier, I'm getting a new Model Three. I, I just got my delivery date is December eighth, right. and um, the first thing I'm going to do is wrap it. Oh yeah. And this color blue is in the final two. Oh. I have this and another color that I'm I'm bouncing back and forth with, which I'm not going to say right now, but. So looking at this now, I might be leaning towards doing it that color, but um, that's really that really pops. I think if I got the Maki, -E, I'd have to get it in that blue. If it was exactly that color, that'd be kind of funny to drive up alongside a, a Maki. -E. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a little different. I think it's slightly lighter. The three M blue that uh, wrap that I, I, I'm, I was uh, that I'm planning on. It's between that and another color, so we'll see. That's pretty soon too. Is that next week? The fourth. No. no, the eighth. The um, eighth. So yeah, okay. it's still it's still like like a week and a half, two weeks. That's when it's so, scheduled to arrive at the Tesla Service Center here in New Jersey. Okay. Can I ask so, about the uh, December fifteenth date? Is that because that's when customers get their cars, or is that a, a press? Oh well, yeah. Certain rules about when the media are allowed to talk about things. Yeah. So so the embargo uh, typically when whenever we drive new cars, uh, manufacturers will say come and go through the wave, and what it does is it eliminates the rush and competition on our side. It's to actually protect the media uh, so that we're not all rushing to get there first and then banging our stories out and making sure they're they're right, right? So basically it's come and drive the car. If you can't make it this week, make it next week. That's fine. No one's going to have their story out before you right. and then make sure everything's good. And then at December 15th at 6 a.m. Eastern, boom, everything will hit. I mean, we've seen this from every vehicle launch. You get the day of the Ram TRX day or the Toyota Super day and everyone has their story. Uh, well, December 15th will be the Mustang day. It's usually not three weeks later. And I think that's because of COVID. Usually it's like a week after they schedule all these test drives and they give everybody a few days to get things together. This seems like a very prolonged you know, period where the embargo lasts for. And I bet it's because they can't get a hundred people together in one room and just and 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 do all these test drives in a day or two. You know what I mean? Like the the Tycon press drive that 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 I did in Europe, there was, you know, 60 or 70 of us, you know, and and you know, they just can't do that now with COVID. So it's they're doing they're probably doing a bunch of small events like what Kyle participated in or he was supposed to participate in, but, you know, he says he was late, so he gets the car for the whole day. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that's why it's been delayed for 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 the uh, for much longer than what it usually is. But uh, customers should get this. Did they say anything about the customers getting this, this before Christmas? Deliveries will start end of uh, this year. So December, uh, basically before the end of this year, they will be in customers' hands. Okay. Which means, uh, and also there's a great uh, owner here. I just uh, randomly, he reached out to me through email. I think he has a mock e vlog is the name of his channel. I'm not exactly sure. But basically, he said, look, I'm on the list to get one pretty early on here in Denver. If you ever need it. Because again, it's very difficult for us to schedule uh, the, the right electric vehicles at the right time. Right. He said we can borrow at any time to do track comparisons, uh, vehicle comparisons, uh -huh. and uh, we have a great racetrack just down the street from the house that we'll start using. So um, maybe on that track we can see if this has the soul of a Mustang, and that'd be an interesting video to try out. What, sure. what spec was this? Because I apologize if I missed it, if you said, because I'm sometimes busy flicking around the videos. Is there, sure. can you say what spec? This, so when we look at the pricing in a minute with the EPA, which is the next story, uh, mm -hmm. where does this one fit into the range? Right. So uh, this is this is the top spec uh, first edition. It is okay. a uh, Mach E 4X. So the four stands for dual motor all wheel drive. And then the X stands for extended range battery. Pack. Nice. So 270 okay. mile EPA was the uh, range of the car that I had driven. Um, yeah. Two, 200. Excellent. 200 what? Two, 270 EPA. Okay, the ex uh, okay, gotcha. Extended right. range all-wheel drive. The extended range rear-wheel drive is 300. 
So yeah, let's why don't we just move on to the next story, which is also about the Ford Mach E and uh, its uh, EPA range has been revealed, and it's pretty much what uh, Ford had said we should expect. Uh, I believe there's like one one variation has like a, a mile an hour or a mile difference, uh, a mile more. So that's good. Uh, so it, it goes like this: basically, the standard range real world drive uh, Mach E will give you 230 miles. Uh, the extended range uh, rear wheel drive will give you 300 miles. That's that's going to be the, like the longest ranging one, I believe. The standard range, that's a small battery, standard range uh, all wheel drive gives you 211 miles, which is borderline okay, not great. And uh, the extended range all wheel drive, big battery, the one that uh, Kyle was driving, 270 miles. So we don't have a number for the GT yet, so that's still to come. And that's the more performance version, so that'll have the, the big battery and I guess all-wheel drive, but more power as well. And I, I expect that's going to be less than 270 miles, probably, what, what do you think, 250, Kyle? Uh, hard to say for sure. We'll have to wait till the numbers come in. Okay. So it's it's worth. I know we don't. Uh, this we're sort of more popular. We can see from the the viewers in in the US. But for our European audience, those numbers are significantly different over here. The, the our test cycle is different, and I believe it includes more urban driving and less highway high speed driving. I think. Right. I double check the exact proportions of that. So over here, the Mustang Mach E has more range. Same car more range than the model y can you can you do you have the wltp numbers there yeah so the one that kyle drove is not 270 over here it's 335 that's a big difference and the model y equivalent which is long range or wheel drive is 313 wow so you know that's the difference again it's the same cars just, just a few thousand miles apart but different test cycles different ways of doing the test it's I think largely accepted that our test cycle is too optimistic for real world, but also it's right. accepted that EPA sometimes, depending on the car, can and how the car is programmed and the software and the efficiency. Sure. Uh, I think it's where Tesla do very, very well because they're very efficient at high speeds. Right. But the thing is, with that, some customers will see... Uh, ranges closer to the EPA estimates rather or or WLTP estimates than other cars. So like Tesla gives, you know, it generally has a pretty high uh, range figures from the EPA and WLTP, but it's harder, I think, for customers. They hit those numbers than in some other cars like, well, the Porsche Taycan is a famous one because it does better than its EPA numbers pretty much generally all the way through. And I think the... Um, both the Mach E and the, the Volkswagen ID4, I think those both of those will get closer to their uh, EPA numbers range official figures than say the Tesla, and that would be a good little test to do actually, do a little yeah. comparison. How much closer, like percentage wise, can do they get to that official figure? You know, because and well, that's what we do with our seventy mile per hour tests, and then Tom puts them in a a chart and says, hey, this one's ten percent below, which you would think every car would be below EPA cruising at 70, but that's not yeah. the case. The Ionic and the Taycan beat it. Yeah, 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 the true. And, and also worth saying, I think on both as well, I think on both test cycles, manufacturers can request to publish a lower figure. And so that is why some of these numbers are quite conveniently round numbers or exactly the same. So I wouldn't be surprised to see, so rather than Ford maxing out that number, so maybe some of those numbers that we just gave were several miles or more higher. Uh, again, I, I think that they would rather their customers were pleasantly surprised rather than disappointed, setting expectations. So it's too convenient that the EPA test comes in bang on where they said it, it it would so i imagine there's been some uh playing around with the numbers afterwards and artificially publishing a lower one would, is that correct over there yeah and i believe we can actually go into the epa documents and see that too i okay. believe that's all public information that's a, future, that's a future show we've got to do that and uh i will say you know ford's had a history of um basically under promising and over delivering with this car every right. single step of the way it's gotten better, faster, cheaper, 
uh, and it and it just is uh, getting better with each announcement. And that's all by design, of course, uh, and it leads to good news stories. So I don't imagine why that would ever change moving into once we see software updates into the future with the vehicle. Now, you've so, had some time uh, with uh, the, the gang at Ford, and again, I don't know what you can and can't say, but whether batteries yep. came up in your briefing sessions, the last I heard, so correct me if I'm wrong, the batteries are made by LG Chem here in Poland. They ship all the way to the US where the car is assembled, and then for a, for 30,000 of those in the first batch, they're going to come back to Europe. Is that? Do you guys know if that's correct? Uh, unsure, you know, I, I okay. because I skipped out on the briefing sessions. I, I was there just to, uh, to focus course. on the car, more or less. Um, but these are all things we can get answers to probably relatively easily. Yeah, I gather when battery supply spools up as part, possibly as part of the Chattanooga VW plant, there might be some extra cell production for the Mustangs coming some way through that deal. I'm not sure, but um, uh, it'll, yeah, it's it'll be interesting to find out what where those cells are made and, and and sort of tracking them around tracking them around the world which of course is the, the problem that you know they're not I, I, the only ones Te tesla have always had that problem with I, I believe uh, the, halfway around the world and being shipped into the us i, I believe the uh, ford ceo was it jim farley i believe he was saying something about ford maybe making their own batteries now because that's something they they said they weren't going to do but i think they i think they're coming around to understanding that you know in at least for a while it's going to be it's going to be a uh, important to be vertically integrated with your battery production because i mean there's limited supply it's going to and the supply is going to get tighter and tighter as you know volumes ramp up so yeah i think they're definitely looking at that possibility hey so uh, what, what this range also tells us um is something about the, the efficiency of the car now so 270 miles that's with a big battery that's is that the 99 kilowatt hours 88 usable mm -hmm. that's the battery pack that i drove yes right so compare that to to the uh i guess the tesla model y is like the one to compare it to because it's, it's about 74 kilowatt hour usable and then right. id4 is 77 kilowatt hour usable yeah. right it's actually um more comparable Tesla's more comparable to the smaller Mach-E battery pack, which is 75 uh, kilowatt hours with 68 usable. The Model Y is very similar to that size pack, much more so than the extended range pack that the Mach-E uses. So it just, it goes to show you that Tesla, you know, actually squeezes out more miles with a battery pack that's considerably smaller than the, right. than the, than the extended range pack on the Mach-E. But again, you know, we're all... You know, th this is all testing protocols because, as Martin mentioned, over here in the U.S., the the Model Y is is rated at a much longer range than the Mach E, but over in in Europe, it's it's rated at a less lesser range. So, you know, we we've got to get these cars, Kyle. We got to we we've got to get these two cars next to each other and just get out on the highway on the same day and and just see which one goes further. Um, we got to figure out how to arrange that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, actually, we did that test between uh, the Hyundai Kona Electric and the Chevrolet Bolt yeah. efficiency run. My, my friend Ben and I took both of them and we drove them next to each other for the same wind. Uh, whenever a car would come up behind, we would pick and choose who dips behind the other one, basically. And we tried to be as scientific as possible uh, to make sure each car went through the same scenario. It didn't need to be a loop style test. They just needed to travel the same road at the same time. So uh, we need to do uh, 2021 is going to be the year of yeah. comparisons for sure, because you're going to have to decipher between Nissan Aria, ID4, Model Y, XC40 Recharge, Polestar 2, and Mustang Mach-E. And I'm sure I'm missing some there. How do you choose on paper which one of those to drive? I mean, they're all so similar. Uh, and, and you know, one's a couple thousand dollars more expensive and one right. has this level of efficiency and one looks this way. But really, it's going to become almost a commodity because uh, we were talking about this uh, yesterday. But the, the thing with choosing an a ICE vehicle is there's a lot more that goes into the driving of the vehicle. There's engine noise. There's transmission yeah. shift points. There's CVT. With an EV, although you can get into the nitty gritty, gritty of electric powertrains, there's no emotion with an electric powertrain. So it's pretty much just your A to B is the same. No, it's, it's true. You drive a Taycan, you drive an I3 at around the city, 
There's mm-hmm. no difference. They make the same noise. They feel pretty much the same way, just pedal mapping. And mm-hmm. so there's less of a differentiation with the auditory emotional side of things with electric vehicles. So it has to be design and numbers related, but you don't yeah. drive cars on paper. So it's got to be which makes you feel the happiest. Right. So uh, I guess, and just touching the next story too, we'll bring that up as well because it's, you know, it's just along the same lines. The uh, Volkswagen ID4 also got, got its official EPA numbers and that's 250 miles. For, yeah, and both versions, I think there's two versions of the first edition or first and uh, what do they call it, the Pro or something? Like I said, all my notes have, are gone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ID Pro S. Right, Pro S. Uh, and that, does it, does it seem to be, okay, so 250 miles, is that is that good enough? Is that compete? Or is it because the price is lower, it's going to make up, Is you know, I don't know. Well, it's slightly better than the Mach E. Uh, you know, the Mach E, the standard range rear wheel drive, is rated at 230 miles, and this right. is the you know the the their rear wheel drive base model uh, is gets 20 miles more, and the usable capacity is only two kilowatt hours more. The usable capacity on the ID4 77 kilowatt hours, and the usable capacity on the Mach E is 75. So for two more kilowatt hours, you get 20 more miles. So the uh, the ID4 is considerably more efficient than the the Mach E. Hmm. It seems pretty close though. Two kilowatt hours, 20 miles. At least in the EPA cycle that in, we're seeing. Right course, in the EPA which cycle, which, which which obviously we've got to go out and test it. But that that's that's a decent. That's a lot more for 20 more miles for only two kilo, kilowatt hour when you consider they're averaging like you know four you know, around four miles per kilowatt hour. So um, instead of the, eight, it gets 12, it gets 20. The ID4 that? is going to be a tough one to beat because it looks great. It feels great. You know, we can talk about our driving impressions on that car and it's got more than enough range for most people, I think. So right. it's going to be tough competition yeah. here. How does it line up with car. prices, uh, Tom? With like Mark Mocky and the ID4? It's very close. I don't have the numbers okay. right in front of me, um, but um, uh, I, I remember it's there. It's it's very close. Now, when the when the ID4 begins production in the US with the slightly smaller battery pack, then it's definitely going to be less because it's going to start at 35,000, but it also won't go quite as far. Um, right. I, you know, I, I we, we've talked about this a couple of times in past podcasts, and I think Kyle agreed with me. I thought the ID4 was like the perfect family hauler. I really do it. Now I haven't driven the Maki yet. I've driven in a Maki. A Ford representative um, was driving, and I was in the vehicle for a while. Um, but and, and I love the Maki. Don't get me wrong. I, I'd probably buy a Maki over an ID4 for myself. But I'm not holding around, you know, three kids and and, and right. you know need to load it up with soccer gear and and, and so forth. Not that the Maki can't do that. I just thought that the ID4 to me, the it just seemed like perfect family vehicle. It really did. Um, it didn't. It didn't do anything amazing, but it did everything very well. Uh, and there's tons of space. Everything was laid out beautifully. It drove, you know, fine. Uh, you know, the Mach is going to blow it away in a drag race. Um, but you know, hey, you know, families don't drag race their cars typically. You know, when 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 they're when, when they're moving the kids around or going on, on holiday uh, weekend uh, holidays. Uh, right. I just I'm, I'm I have very high expectations for the ID4. To me, that is like the, the best of class for this type of a uh, vehicle that you're looking just to haul around the people. I, I, after driving that, I, I came out saying, you know, I don't know why anybody would buy, say, a Honda CRV again with with this vehicle available. And at that price point, even though it costs a little bit more than a CRV up front. Uh, after a couple of years, you're gonna you're gonna be you know have a lower total cost of ownership with the ID4. It's just so much nicer, you know. I, I get in my car and I go somewhere, and you know it's just so nice not to. I don't know. I so Kyle, you were talking about the emotion of of the sound. You know, I really like that. There's no sound. I don't. I'm not listening for what's going wrong <laughs> with the engine. You know, because my other vehicle is like a uh, what is it thirty two years old. So I'm always listening very closely, you know, what's, what's going to break, what's, what's going to go wrong. My car, I just get in, I don't have to worry about any, everything. It just always works. And yeah, it's, 
Yeah, huge benefit of electric cars. Just get in, go, and they either work or they don't work. And 99.9% .9 of the time, they work. Right. Oh, but there's no like, oh, I feel like my electric motor has a misfire. It just doesn't work at that point. Right. So That's it's true. on or off. But very rarely, I mean, I for the amount of miles I've done with EVs, knock on wood, never had failure to the point where I couldn't drive one. Right. I expect... Mm. Can I, you know, can I also add as well, like the the point of us for our viewers and listeners, and the point of 2021 being a, a big year of testing for Inside EVs and and all of us with our own channels is because I think you need to know this information. This isn't just car nerds, you know, statting out for the sake of it. So I went to configure the ID4 this mm -hmm. week in the UK and buried deep, deep in the options list. It's not a rant about VW options list, by the way. Again, is uh, is the heat uh, pump. Yeah. Um, right. And it's, you know, when you've gone through the car, you've chosen the interior, the wheels, and there are a lot of options on the ID4. And I was uh, doing the Skoda ENIAC as well. Um, but then deep, deep into the options, it, was, it wasn't crazy price. It was less than a thousand pounds, eight or nine hundred pounds. But there was the tick box. There was the little question mark that you roll over with your mouse. And so I was like, OK, I'll do that and see what the pop up box says. And it just says, adds a heat pump. Hmm. Now, I'm sorry, but for ID4 buyers, for Skoda ENIAC buyers, that means zero. Like, no one's Googling what does a heat pump in an EV do, apart from, like, us and you watching this because you're watching an EV podcast. But I really think that's our job next year as well, is that, that like, when we talk to people, when we talk to friends and family and everyone watching this as well, uh, just to sort of explain about how EVs work to the next group of people who are going to buy one. And, oh, and please tell them, tick the heat pump box if you possibly can, if you're living somewhere cold. <laughs> Hey, Martin, are, are you buying one? I like the Skoda ENIAC, personally. I prefer the styling of it. Uh, right. the, two, the, the, the two sort of sister cousin cars that I'm really impressed with are the, uh, the Seat Elborn. Um, oh, yeah. So can't, can't configure that yet, but I did configure uh, my ideal spec on the Skoda ENIAC and have that printed out somewhere here. And, uh, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't uh, bought one, but um, I just prefer the way it looks. I like the, the options list on it is... Is better, but again, it's a it's a pretty deep options list. You know, it's, every it's it's a typical OEM options package of do you want the heated steering wheel, the heated seats, do you want USB sockets in the back? Which I would love those things just to be in a car these days. So, so this is this is advantage of being in Europe. You get not only the, the Volkswagen ID four, you get this basically the same car by Skoda and Seat as well. Any, yeah, any, go ahead. yes. I so I had a Skoda uh, Octavia VRS. Uh, for a while, uh, the estate or wagon, as you'd, you'd, you'd call it, which is the rapid one with the, the the Audi engine in. So I'm a, you know, I've had good experiences in Skodas, and I'd buy another one tomorrow. Sorry, carry on, Dom. No, that's good, Sh Skoda. Skoda. Yeah, it'd be nice. Uh, I wish I, that'd be a great shootout, wouldn't it? I don't know the the Elborn. Is that on the ID4? Or is that the ID3? It's the ID3. So, but it's um, it was going to be uh the sayat but they uh they, i don't think they because sayat is priced so much cheaper than vw as a as a brand right it would mean basically getting the id3 at such a discount or not really going with the sayat brand values of being the sort of cheaper spanish bit of volkswagen so they have quietly not calling it a sayat and they're calling it a cupra which is the performance right. expensive bit of sayat they're calling it the cupra elborn uh but no, it's no no details to talk about yet but it, again i just think the styling is sharper on both of those cars compared to the mothership that, that yeah. looks uh, uh, softer, but as as Kyle said in his ID uh, four video uh, recently, it just it just like the ID four makes you happy. It looks like a happy car, but I like something a little more. I don't know if I say aggressive, I'll sound like a boy racer, but I the styling, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we have different tastes. <laughs> it is subjective, yeah. Martin, right. to your point about ticking the box on the heat pump, it's one of the main reasons why I sold my Model 3 and ordered a new one, because right. it has the heat pump. So, you know, and unfortunately, as you noted, that means nothing to 99% of right. the buyers. It you know, but, be an option even. But, but it's, not an op it's not an option on the Model 3. You know, that's one of the things <clears> that Tesla does well. I mean, we beat Tesla up here a lot. There's a lot of things that just drive us nuts what they do. But right. one of the things they do is they just include everything it's, it's very simple. You order a Tesla. There's like three things you can choose, color, wheels, and if the, the interior, and autopilot. I guess there's four things. Pre it's like, sound? Yeah. Sound? no, that's all included. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's okay. just, you know, tick, 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 order, and it's done. There's no pages of, 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 of options like you just yeah. described. It's like, that's it. There you go. And, um, you know, you whip out your cell phone, you order one in like 45 seconds. So yeah. I know that's unusual for most people, and it'll make some people un 
uneasy. But, you know, th- a lot of people are going to love it. And I happen to be one of those people where just, you know, give me a couple options and that's it. Let me choose my colors, include everything in the car. That's the price. And and, and just go from there. But even then, yeah, to be on. fair, the the ID4 configurator in the U.S. is the opposite of the U.K. It's very Model 3 like. Oh, okay. it's color. You can't even choose your wheels and your interior color. And that's pretty much it. So, yeah, put in, uh, yeah, whatever zip code, sure. And okay, just go uh, to the ID4 Pro. Our headquarters and, in Miami uh, there. And uh, watching and this, this on YouTube, we're configuring one in real life. So, literally, ID4 Pro, because the first is sold out. Mm-hmm. So, yep. uh, I get grand. the Pro Nav. Ba-da, 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 ba-da. Okay, cool. Build and reserve. Location. Let's go. 32303. Oh, okay. Okay, that's accepted. Yeah, accepted. it took Miami. Okay. That's cool. Okay. So, uh, so, there's that. Reserve. Oh, so you got exterior color four to choose from. Mm-hmm. Right. There's all there's. If you get the gradient or the nicer one, you can get uh, blue as an additional Ooh, color. Oh, okay. Uh, that's it. And then it's it's the pro or the pro s statement. Mm-hmm. And then the gradient, which is black trim. Ah, right. Okay. Nice. Right. So now you get the blue. Now we get the dark blue metallic. Then and then do you we want get gradient black roof ma- basically? Oh, okay. And 20 inch alloys rather than the. Uh, it's nice. still, I'm pretty sure they're both 20s. And I could be wrong on that. The oh, lighter interior. We want all wheel drive coming in mid 21. And the, that's it. That And that's all you do. I'm that's done. great. That's great. There's that's 50, that, and that's perfect. almost. <laughs> yeah, I thought they did a really nice job in the US on the configurator. And I know it's the guy really who, nice. who, who did the options packages here. And he came from Tesla. I'm sure they won't like hearing it, but oh, uh, yeah. you it, know, basically, yeah. he took that same approach and and made it really nice here. Volkswagen has a few people from uh, from Tesla working for him. I met a really nice guy. I believe his engineer works for uh, Volkswagen. And when he worked at Tesla, he actually vo- uh, drove an e Golf for that whole time, and he was involved in the the battery programs. A lot of Tesla employees drove e Golfs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It, yeah, I'm kind of torn about the e golf. You know, I looked at it when I was buying my trying to choose my own car. I was like, mm. yeah, I like them, but I don't love them. I don't like the fact that the battery packs air cooled and you can't DC charge them more than a couple times in a day. And uh, that that really was just it for me at that point. And it's not fun enough to justify dealing with the. It's not that fast and everything. So, like, if you're going to have a compromised vehicle, you get a Fiat 500e, you get a yeah, yeah. smart electric, because then you get the joy of at least dealing with the compromise of a bad EV. Right. It, it was a good placeholder until Volkswagen got serious about their electric vehicles. I mean, let's face it, that's heart. what it, I know that, but it, that's why, because it was a good one, but yeah. it was a compliance car. It was made so that VW can just get something out there until they started seriously making their own dedicated platforms. And now we have that with the ID brand. But that said, I'm, I'm not criticizing it. It actually was a really good car other than what Kyle noted about the fact that it didn't have a sophisticated thermal management system. They right. drove great, very pl- great car, but all golfs do. But I think the, I almost think the Fiat 500 would be even more fun to drive. Gotta, gotta yeah, Fiat 500 is more fun to drive. It's more plasticky. Again, we're talking about the previous generation, right. not the current that we don't get here in the U.S. Um, but but those cars are all rattle traps now. I mean, they they pretty much are you know five six thousand dollars anywhere you look, and they're right. great. But the problem is front wheel drive can't do big skids, so you get the smart electric, and then you can do big skids, <laughs> and you can put the roof down in it. So it's just the ultimate car. You cannot argue that. <laughs> okay, I won't. I won't argue. That. Uh, didn't you say the candy was the ultimate car last week? Okay, so <laughs> we're going to have to do a, Kyle. a candy versus smart electric I, drive. These I are that's talks. what I want to see, and you have to include the tug of war that I'm the one that Absolutely. mentioned last week. I want to see a tug of war on those. Two we'll cars. put your face, a printout of your face, <laughs> in the middle, and whichever side your face goes over is there how we go. decide who wins. Uh, either that, or I want to be there. You got to schedule <laughs> right, that. One, okay. and I'll fly out to Colorado or something, and uh, right. I want to be there for the tug of war for sure. Yes, hundred percent. Okay. Hey, so let's move on a little bit. Um, so the. Uh, Elon Musk was interviewed for a, a battery conference that's going on in Europe. Uh, I think it was the European Battery Conference, uh, something like that. <laughs> Very, you know. Um, 
And so, yeah, uh, so he had to say that the Tesla Semi is now going to get a thousand kilometers of range at 621 miles, which is actually kind of close to a prediction that he made like a couple of years ago in 2018. He said, you know, it's probably going to improve from like 500, I think it was saying then to like 600. So, yeah, 621 miles. Uh, and we ha- well, we still haven't seen the Tesla Semi in, in you know, production. We, they have a few that they're actually using at Tesla and I guess testing with it, but that's, that's a vehicle I'm really, man, I wish I really wanted to ha- be happening now. I want to, I want to see some production. Oh. Do we know, yeah. do we even know where they're going to build it? I think is that the Gigafactory in the Fremont? I can't uh, even I, remember. I, I... I do. Is it going to be Austin? Interestingly, when you listen to his words, if you actually, because I I, <clears throat> I watched the um, uh, the twenty minute video and then reread the transcript, and and again, it, there's something about the way he speaks and his cadence sometimes, and so you you've got to read the words on the page sometimes. Yeah. And he said, "We can easily get to eight hundred kilometers now. We believe there's a path." to a thousand kilometers so he didn't say because i heard it the first time i watched it i heard right. semi truck semi truck a thousand kilometers 620 miles but he didn't say that he said we think we have a path to a thousand kilometers which is obviously the 4680 cells obviously the right. structural battery pack obviously right. all of those things but yeah it was it was really interesting how he was cautious with parsing his words somewhat yeah but he said 800 kilometers Again, the phrase easily. So he's gone from easily to path two. So easily 500 miles, 800 kilometers, 500 miles. And look, the things like the European driver limits nine hours a day with the tachograph. um, Even if you stuck it at the the speed limit, which is 56 miles an hour on 40 ton or 42 ton trucks, you know, you couldn't get 500 miles, even if you just woke up, didn't take a break and drove. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's more than enough already for for all of those haulage uses. So. Yeah, man, the rules are so different here. 56 oh. mile an hour top speed. That's crazy. Oh, here's really? 70. Can you go faster? Oh, okay, right. Oh, yeah, right. they go 70 mile. And, you know, and a lot of companies have them. Um, what do you call it? Yeah. Restricted. Speed limited to 68. Yeah, you can't oh. go any faster than wow. 60, 70 miles an hour. But it, you get some independent owner owner operators. They're going at 80 miles an hour. Yeah, they're shredding. We've seen 80, 85, 90 in some cases. Like sometimes I'm running autopilot. Like out here, our speed limits are 75, 80 miles an hour. I'm at 85. And I just see this giant truck just inching, inching forward up on me. And, you know, it's always these guys and they're old Peterbilts running wide open throttle with lumber in the back. And you know what? That's the real American. American trucking spirit right there. Oh my God. So, like, so 40 tons is 88,000 pounds. And yeah. they, we don't run and go, quite that heavy here. We'll run 70, 75,000 typically. Okay. Wow. Okay. No, no, we're not allowed to do that. And you can only drive for nine hours a day. And, and But a lot of those, some of them will have more than one driver uh, or they'll run the trucks, you know, 24 seven with shifts. So it is important that they charge, recharge quickly and have big battery packs. Um, but yeah, no, no more specifics. Weren't we supposed to start getting the semis in 2020? They were supposed yeah. to start delivering them the end of this year. I guess, that's, this year. I guess that's, that's not, not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. So, you, want, you, know, you wonder if 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 Elon knew all along that they weren't going to release it until they had that next generation of battery cells. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk that the 2170s were just too heavy. To, to really be used in in the semi and that you know that the, they could have you know they could have known this for the last two or three years that they weren't going to release it until they could ramp up production of these new cells because that they're, they're more energy dense they're going to be lighter with the structural pack so you know I mean uh, you know these companies uh, Tesla and, and all the companies it's not like they just make these decisions last minute these are all this has been planned out for quite some time. They knew they weren't going to really be releasing the car in 2020 a, w- a while ago. The, the car, the the, the truck, uh, yeah. and it's disappointing because, you know, the electric buses, electric electric semis. Uh, you know, they're such a great use case for these vehicles. It's a shame we don't have any of them yet, but hopefully it's coming soon. That's right. what we all said when the the Roadster flashed up on screen with a 200 kilowatt hour pack, and so many, uh, you know, kind of people who were aware of how big the packs are and how heavy they are did that head scratch for so like i i still do the head scratch because even if you use the 2170 cells whatever they are which is 4.8 amp hours a cell and you work out well that's the weight of them and they'll need this many of them to do 200 kilowatt hours you can't make a car that that is going to go i mean but they need enough 
they made the the prototype, which had, I guess, I don't know, had a, a size, at least. a size pack. Yeah, yeah. Um, had, had a performance. What was, what was in? What was interesting is actually on that to circle back was on the battery European Battery Conference call that Elon talked about. He talked about prototyping. And, it's, and that was something yeah. I've heard him say before, but he brought it up again. He said, it is so easy to make a prototype, almost admitting, well, look, we could make one Roadster and one semi truck or 10 yeah. semi trucks. And he said, prototyping is so easy. But when you try and make a product at scale, uh, that's when the difficulty comes in. And he also took a bit of a shot at all those stories that we see coming out of normally like the mainstream press. They just got a press release rewritten. And he said, <clears throat> excuse me, all those stories that come out about a new battery technology has been invented and evs will go to he said all of this is on the bench right. he said so th this isn't all of these are just lab results and right. he took a bit of a shot at other people who have been saying we've got a great technology because he's like great good on you but now scale it you can't well we'll see i mean uh, there's some I don't know, lg and gm has got some good chemistry coming up so i'm really curious to see how that matches up with uh with tesla's uh 4680 you know which is Mm. At the, about the pack level, I, I think uh, it, will, it should be pretty close, actually. Um, yeah, but uh, actually, I had meant to, to mention this other story before we talked about the semi. Um, the Tesla Model S now gets more range. It uh, it's four hundred nine miles instead of four hundred was it two four hundred three miles? I believe it was in June. They had gone through the whole car and updated. You know, they changed like the the uh, the oil pump on the rear motor, in the rear induction motor from uh, a mechanical pump to an electric pump. And there was a, a few other software and driveline changes they made to get up to f over 400 miles. And now it's 409 miles. So it's, it's, uh, that's more than the, than, than two versions of the Lucid Air. The, the uh, Lucid Air Touring and Lucid Air Pure are what, 406 miles, I believe, Tom? Yeah, so it just slightly b beats it, and uh, you know, <laughs> why? <laughs> well, because Elon has got to be number one. Let's face it; <laughs> that's why. Um, right. uh, you know, I, I, I think that if other manufacturers made this kind of small um, uh, upgrade, you know, where the car went slightly further, they wouldn't even recertify it. You know, they huh. would just leave it at the 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 the. the the level that what it, what it was at and just let it go from there and not, uh, you know, go through the process of recertifying it so you could add, uh, you know, six miles of range or whatever, whatever it was. So, um, but Tesla wants to, uh, you know, they have this, um, you know, ethos that they're number one with everything. They're the fastest or the furthest. So I think, I think Elon, you know, it's part of his bravado that he, he need, he needed the vehicle to have the, the longest range. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's great. And, I, and I'm not criticizing Tesla. They're the only manufacturer that just keeps, keep squeezing out more miles. They just sure. they're obsess on efficiency and extending the range. And that's fantastic. It's part of the reason why people love them, but you know, to, to go through the process of recertifying, to, to add a couple of miles of range. I don't think the other manufacturers would have done that. Um, I think they would have just left the, the certification and just said, well, customers are, they're getting a couple free miles there on, on the car and waited until they had a big jump in range before they went through the process of recertification. And it's kind of weird. The, the actual overall efficiency drops a little bit. I think it improved in the city and dropped on the highway. So the actual, like the, the combined number went dropped to like a from I think it's one sixteen now and it was one seventeen, mm -hmm. so that's kind of odd. Then and you end up getting more miles. So I'm not exactly sure how they how they got the range increase. It doesn't seem like you'd would have like that small thing with a battery chemistry change. You know, I don't know, a couple more ounces of Elon Ego would that would that give you a few <laughs> miles? That's their secret sauce. That's what they added. There we go. <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, it was kind of interesting, though. You know, four hundred, but it's still much it's yeah. far short of the five hundred and seventeen miles, I believe, of the the top Lucid model. So, you know, it's, they're still not top dog. But I mean, well, technically, yeah, that's for sale now. You can buy. You can't get a Lucid yet, but soon, right? What's the, what's the date, Tom? Uh, I've got, I think it's May of, of 2021, somewhere, some, yeah, sometime, sometime somewhere around spring. there. And, um, okay, I yeah. fully expect Elon to 
to figure out a way of one upping that and and uh, and and yeah. have uh, the Raven or something, you know, where yeah, it, uh, it 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 has uh, you know, they'll be even if the vehicle isn't ready, right before Lucid starts selling their cars, there's going to be some giant Tesla announcement right. that just tries to you know dismiss everything that Lucid did. You know, I mean, still from it's, thunder. You know, I, I know I've used this analogy before, but here in, I live in New Jersey, uh, baseball with the Mets and the Yankees. It's kind of like George Steinbrenner when he was alive. No matter what the Mets did, and I'm a Mets fan, um, you can probably see there's some memorabilia <laughs> on that shelf behind me. I don't know if you can see it or not. But whenever the Mets did anything that could even be possibly positive, Steinbrenner had to grab all the the the, the headlines in the papers the next day. I mean, even if many had a fire as manager, he, he might even have liked the manager, but he, <laughs> he needed to be <laughs> in the headlines. So, like, okay, you're fired. I think he fired and hired Billy Martin like nine times, and and <laughs> sometimes it was just because he knew it would dominate. The press, like Martin didn't do anything wrong. He just get the phone call. Oh, by the way, you're fired again. Like, you know, the Mets just signed Tom Seaver. So we we need to to, to be a, a one up on you or something like that, you know. But Elon's got the same. And, you know, you got to love that. You know, it, it's like that fighting spirit where, you know, you know, I mean, it, there's negative sides to it. But it's also great that he just demands to be the best. And, yeah. um, you know, which, which is cool. And that's what you want. If you're a customer, you know, you, 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 you want that in a, in, in a CEO. Again, uh, coming full circle. That's the second full circle I've come, uh, is that the European battery conference was uh, his session was at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, 10 for me, 11 local, which was 2 AM where he was. And, and mm -hmm. the interviewer or the, 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 um, uh, it wasn't so much a keynote, but it was just him for that 20 minutes. So, so at the beginning, thank you so much. It's, is it two o'clock here? He was like, yeah, no problem. Like, right. that's like, that was his attitude of, I mean, why I mean, wouldn't I be working at two o'clock in the morning? Like, yeah, let's, let's crack on. I'm, you know, so he is that <laughs> beast of a kind of, of, of <laughs> a machine. If you follow him on Twitter and, and get notifications for his tweets, you, he, he tweets at 2 a.m. Pretty regularly, <laughs> it's not it's not too too out of the norm, norm for him to be up at that time, and that's on like West Coast time too. So it's like super late for East Coast time. Uh, so hey, well, um, while we're on the subject of, of range and, and Tesla, uh, during that same interview, he also mentioned that uh, uh, some existing models could get as much as four hundred and thirty five miles of range. So I guess we're talking about I don't know Model Y and three and things. What do you think the new the new Model Y from Berlin, 4680 batteries. Yeah, they'll be shipped over, won't they, from the pilot line. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how the the German team blend with with Tesla's way of doing it, which is let's just do it. Let's just see how we, you know, rather than let's spend six months waiting cars and taking them all over the, the planet from, you know, ice caps to the desert and driving them. I think the minute those machines those uh, are installed, we know they're doing a big hiring spree at the moment. They'll start to churn the cars out. And, okay, so, so you think the forty six eighty packs that will go into Model Y will be like hundred kilowatt hour packs around? It'll be I, like I, more energy. No, I think I um, no, I think they're going to be smaller than that because yeah. I don't know that they're not going to. They don't need. They'll keep that in their back pocket. I think for now. They will increase the margin on the cars, use smaller packs, and just get slightly more range than. But otherwise, you're going to harm your US and Chinese made products too much. 435 miles, though. You got you to do something to get that. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think it'll be the Model Y to begin with because, oh, okay. you know, if you're, if you're about to buy a Model Y in the US, you'd be like, well, why, do, why does this one do 70 miles less? Right. Because you bought it in, in 2020 and not 2022, maybe. Well, yeah. Yeah. So they they need the Model Y to pick up the slack of declining Model 3 sales. Um, I'm not being mean saying that. Um, and frankly, uh, Model S and X production that is at this stage incidental. You know, right. I know that the COVID quarter was sort of 5,000 of them combined for the quarter, but let's write that off. Really? Otherwise, you're looking at... Um, January quarter one, quarter three were like S and X combined at seventeen thousand for the quarter for those yeah, two models. That's not like great. S at this stage, S and X are a sideshow. No, I mean amazing cars. 
it's hard to criticize because people think I'm saying anything bad. Right. But, but they're not they're not they're not flying off the shelf. You know. oh, no, they don't matter anymore. They the I, Model Y, it's all Model Y. Right. Soon Cybertruck. So they I don't think they'll do anything that harms Model Y in the US. Um so I don't think we're gonna see the Berlin and I'd love it because I'd love one, but I think the European made Model Y won't be that much better in the specs. It will be an entirely different car, but it won't so, be that much. So what's better. gonna get four hundred and thirty five miles? I mean, the Model S is almost there, I guess now. But yeah, I mean, Maybe but they're going to have the plaid. The plaid version is coming out soon. That's going to get like a lot, lot more than that. Oh, man. A year away, though. At least a year away. Yeah, I can't keep track of it all. <laughs> I, need, I need a big tra- whiteboard on my. Yeah, we need like one of those things with all the bits of string drawn between the pictures. Right. The, you know. Exactly. Prime, prime suspect Elon in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> all right hey, let's move on to the next uh, thing so um okay really quickly i just want to mention that the byd d1 has uh, been unveiled and shown in china and it, it's a it's a significant car because although it's not coming here they expect to build like a million of these things in the next five years like um i they were planning like hoping for to do like ten thousand this year or something but they're not uh but next year we could see as many as like a hundred thousand that's a, that's a lot of new cars. This thing's uh, the, the BYD D1. It's designed and built uh, specifically for a ride-sharing company called uh, DD Chujing. I, I believe it's pronounced. Um, yep, yeah, Chujing. Uh, it's got like a sliding door in the back, and it's really for. It's like this company is huge. I, um, if you pull up the article, you can look up the article on Inside of East. Um, like at the bottom, it'll say uh, you know, how many millions of customers they have and, and drivers. Now, this is not going to be an autonomous vehicle. This is made for you know someone to drive people around. And yeah, a million of them, 250 miles of ranges. It uses the BYD Blade battery, which is a uh, a low energy density kind of battery, but it's also you know very stable and long lasting. And they're doing this is I believe cell to pack design the blade, so. Although the cell uh, energy density is low at the pack, it, it's much improved at the pack level compared to maybe a, a better, uh, a better, a more energy dense cell. So that's kind of interesting. Tom, do you find this? What, what do you have any thoughts about this thing? Uh, I think it's a cool car. It looks a lot like the ID three. You know, um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, in my opinion, it, it has it has those styling cues, but it, it the the pack is what's interesting. The structural pack and um, just like what you said that the fact that um, while the, the cells themselves have a lower energy density you can put many more of them in the pack because there's no you eliminate the modules it's just right. these these um, uh, blades and they're also supposedly um, much safer they have a le- le- much less um, you know a uh, uh, chance of a fire even if the cells are penetrated they did plenty of tests with them where they like you know uh which they do with all batteries you know impale them with spikes <laughs> and so forth and so on and uh these seem to be very very stable which is good for you know ride sharing where these cars are going to be on the roads you know driving many 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 miles over all kinds of different uh you know road hazards and so forth and so on um you know I like it. I think I think it's a really cool, inter- interesting vehicle. I love how the doors slide open like a minivan door, um, and that's really for um, uh, to be safer in traffic. If these are ride sharing cars, they're going to doors are going to be opening and closing frequently. In, you know, in traffic, and you know, especially in in China, the streets are are pretty intense. I've driven there. Trust me, very intense. Uh, <laughs> and and the fact that the doors can slide open like that, you don't have a door swinging open. Uh, you know, where, where a car can hit it, or even these motor scooters and motorcycles and motorbikes. Those are the things I think that are more of a hazard than the cars in China. They're just whizzing all around you constantly, almost without rules. And uh, so I think that's a really good feature to have in this car. And uh, I think it's cool. Uh, I find it interesting that the promotional videos they make here that we're watching, if you're watching the YouTube uh, ver- version of the show, uh, they're very lifestyle oriented. They're not like going over all the details of the of the vehicle itself so much. It has a little bit of you know it, them being used by by customers and and the driver shows them, but there's you know there's a lot of extra lifestyle footage. You know, soft pastels, running people, no car. 
I gotta say, China looks like a nice place to visit. Pink buildings, green grass. Right. Pretty amazing uh, if, you, if it looks just like it does here in this simulation. Uh, yeah, say, oh, not pre- exactly. Pre- pre- grass, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, but it's it's nice to see the BYD doing things. You know, they've got they're they've been man, their technology isn't like I don't think it's cutting edge. Like this blade battery is like 140 watt hours per kilogram, which is like was that half of what the original Tesla Roadster was or something? You know, it's it's not. It's not like an impressive number at that, but they've been plugging away and they've got, they've got buses, they've got semi trucks. And I saw that we have a semi thing on their semi truck. There, there's a bunch of them being uh, bought uh, by an LA company. So you're going to see a lot of uh, BYD uh, semis in LA and it's basically a, a day cab. So very flat front and, it, and just behind it, before you get to the trailer, there's like this huge box with, I guess the battery, so, you know, not super sophisticated, but it gets the job done well enough at a probably a decent value. And so, well, the, 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 the batteries are cheap. You know, they're, I read a, a piece of research recently that put them between 82 and $85 per, kilo, uh, per kilowatt hour. Right. So that's cheap. Yeah. And I, mean, I think with the packaging, and I, I, I may have read this wrong, you could fit 30 to 40% more of the cells in the oh. pack because there's no modules because it's cell to pack. So, right. so yes, they have a lower energy density, but as Martin mentioned, they cost a lot less and you could squeeze a lot more of them in the pack. So you're not losing as much range sure. at, you know, as you would if these things had to get packaged in modules, which then go into the pack. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what the, the pack energy densities are compared to other things. But anyway, so let's move on to something else from China, Xpeng. Uh, introduced the limited edition P7 wing at the Guangzhou Motor Show. Uh, the So the P7, we've seen the uh, Xpeng uh, P7 before, but this is the P7 wing. And if you're looking at the YouTube channel, you, you can see the picture over there and you might have an idea why they call it the wing. Tom, I, I'm not picking on you this show, but uh, you're an Xpeng expert. Like Xpeng expert. <laughs> so yeah, first of all, I want to say I'm really disappointed that I'm not at the Guangzhou Motor Show this year. Um, it's one of the more enjoyable shows that I like to go to. Um, really cool, really big um, uh, area where, and there's all kind of crazy, funky Chinese cards that you get to check out. Um, and I was invited, and uh, uh, Xpeng actually wanted to try to figure out a way to get me there. Um, but I would have had a quarantine for 14 days when I arrived, and I wasn't sure I'd be allowed back. So right. that was kind of something that made me say, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, but in any event, yeah. So they 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 announced that they're going to have a limited edition um, P7 wing that's kind of uh, scissor doors. Kind of reminds me of the uh, BMW i8 uh, wings uh, doors. And uh, it was cool. It's only going to be available for the Chinese market because they're going to start uh, exporting at some point the P7 right. to Europe. Uh and then uh, uh, eventually, at some point, way down the road, um, you know, North America. Um, uh, talking years away, though, um, if if and when that happens. But um, this version, the wing version, will only be available for the Chinese market, and uh, it's considerably more expensive than uh, a regular P7. Uh, I think it's something to the effect of like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more than the regular P7, uh, and it comes fully loaded. It's like a total top spec, you know, with every option you can get model uh, and something that, you know, it's going to be, is, is it, is it, you know, is the value worth, I think it's like $60,000, $62,000 when you can get like a, a pretty well-equipped P7 in the high forties. So it's, yeah. it's, it, it costs a lot more, but it's the exclusivity thing. It's, it's the, it's the thing of was, Oh, you know, I've got one of however many thousand. Now they didn't announce how many they were going to make, but I don't think it's going to be a tremendous amount. I think it's just going to be for people that want to have those rare cars that few other people have. Um, the bigger news that came out of, of the Guangzhou Motor Show for Xpeng really was the fact that they're going to be um, shipping cars with LiDAR starting uh-huh. in early 2021. Uh, it'll be the first electric car in the world that has LiDAR as part of its ADAS system. Now, I wrote an article on this and I made a mistake, oh. at which I, oh. I want to come clean with that now. I said that it was going to be the first car to come equipped with LiDAR. And I actually did a little research, Dom, and I think I pinged you yeah, and yeah, said, we, hey, we, do you know any other cars? That And you're like, no, I don't think so. 
but the Audi A8 has LiDAR <laughs> built into it. Of course, yeah. the readers were very quick to let me know. And uh, I actually posted this late at night, went to sleep. I woke up in the morning and there were like 10 people like, hey, idiot, the Audi A8's had this since 2018. So thank you, um, everyone, for reminding me that I don't know everything. Um, but uh, it, I, I was able to correct it that it was the first electric car to have in our based uh, ADAS system. All right. I, yeah, I recall that conversation and I had no idea that Audi had, you know, I, I didn't even see those comments because I don't know if uh, people must not have actually called you an idiot because that gets flagged <laughs> in our comment system. And no, then, no, no, and no, I, no, not, not <laughs> that, but, but I felt like an idiot. I, you know, it's nothing worse waking up in the morning, reading the article, reading the comments in an article yeah. that you post to find out that you were wrong about something. And yeah. when you try to get all these things right, I admit I am not, I am far, far, far from perfect. And I actually did some searching on the internet, what cars yeah. come with LiDAR, couldn't come up with anything. Nothing came up that the Audi A8, of course, we don't really follow the A8 here at Inside EVs. It's not an electric car, right. um, but uh, uh, you know, I was, I was quickly, you know, made aware of the fact that that's been available since 2018. Uh, of course, there's cars that are going to be coming out in 2021 now, like Lucid, for instance, that's going to have LiDAR systems. But um, I think uh, I think it's safe to say that the P7 is going to be the first car, electric, fully electric car that's going to have it um, available for its uh, autonomous driving features. It should be interesting. It would be kind of nice to see um, how it lines up with the with Tesla Autopilot. Uh, I guess, <laughs> but it's only available in China, so we'd have to we have to do do it like a test in China somehow. So, so now you're segueing over to how it compares to Tesla, and I, I think I have to, uh, even though we don't want to really drag this out. Yeah. When that announcement came out that they were going to be the first car with um, uh, lidar system, of course, Elon tweeted uh, something to the effect of. You know, yeah, that's great, but you know they're using our stolen store source code for their right. autonomous driving features. So you know, um, that's something that that's a drum that Elon's been beating for the last couple of years. Now I, I, we don't have time to really go over this in depth, but there, you know, an ex Tesla employee while he worked for Tesla downloaded Tesla source code for their autopilot years ago, while he worked for Tesla, which isn't illegal; it's against company policy. He then later went to work for X Motors, which is the U.S. subsidiary of Xpeng in their autonomous driving um, uh, you know, uh, team. Now, as mentioned earlier, that there were Tesla employees working for, uh, I think it was at Volkswagen uh, or Ford, I forget. Um, this is normal in this, in this industry. That sure. it, it, the employees go back and forth from, from company to company. In any event, Tesla um, initiated a lawsuit against this engineer saying that, you know, that they're concerned that he might have taken the Tesla software code to Xpeng for Xpeng to use it. It's been bouncing back and forth in the courts for a while. Basically, where they're at now is um, Tesla wanted, was demanding that Xpeng give them their source code so they can see if it if it was a, a, a copy. Uh, and Xpeng wouldn't do that. They had agreed to give it to a neutral third party. And that's where we're at now. A U.S. court a few months ago sided with Xpeng and said, look, um, they don't have to give you their source code, um, but I will we'll appoint a neutral third party. You provide us with your source code, they'll provide us with theirs. The neutral third party will will, will, will analyze it and say if it is um, if there's anything in there that could be uh, considered uh, copied or stolen or whatever. Um, we don't know where that is at this point. I don't know if Tesla agreed to do that. We don't know. I know Xpeng agreed to do it. I don't mm -hmm. know if Tesla agreed to give their source code to the neutral third party. So in any event, uh, so IP theft is a huge problem. It's a huge problem throughout the world. Uh, you know, U.S. companies steal from U.S. companies, but in particular, we've seen Chinese companies steal technology from U.S. and European companies. We know this happens, mm -hmm. um, but we can't paint at all of these companies with this broad brush and just say, well, since it happens and this kind of looks like it happened here, it must be what happened here. We, we just don't do that. But, you know, in, in, in the U.S., you, you've got to be proven guilty. And I know a lot of Tesla followers, you know, are, are very quick to condemn Xpeng and say, you know, hey, you know, if it, if it looks like this and smells like this, it's this. I'm not willing to draw that conclusion until I see some kind of proof that yeah. they did it. But, um, you know, uh, the Xpeng uh, CEO did come out with a statement. Uh, he, he, he made, uh, 
a comment on a Chinese social media. I forget the name of it. It's kind of like their Twitter. Um, and, and, yeah. And he basically said that we're going to beat the pants off Tesla uh, with, with, all, with self-driving features in China. Um, and, uh, and, and in the rest of the world, what we're going to be putting out will be equivalent to what Tesla does. But here in China, they will not be able to compete with us. And I've heard this from other industry experts also, that Tesla's autopilot system isn't very good in China. It's not as good at dealing with um, unique Chinese, uh, you know, driving conditions uh, as it is throughout. It's not as good there as it is in the U.S. and Europe, but that um, Xpeng and, and say NIO and the Chinese based companies, their autonomous driving systems will be better than Tesla's in the Chinese market. We'll, we'll have to see, um, you know, when, when, when the systems are available. Yeah, that should be an interesting thing to watch for sure. Um, I, just quickly talking about uh, Tesla's autopilot, the beta, full self-driving beta. Um, I, Kyle drove a, a car with that a few weeks back and told us about it. And if you're watching any of the new videos that some of the, the beta testers have been putting up, it's improving quite a bit over those original things. Uh, hopefully, Kyle, you get a chance to, to go for another spin before... Uh, uh, it might be, I guess everyone or a lot more people might have access to it pretty soon, but it'd be interesting to see how it compares yeah. like now with what you drove. I think uh, it'll be fun to see the improvement because there was a lot yeah. of room when I drove yeah. the car with the system, a lot of room for improvement. Uh, I haven't been following that situation as closely as I would like. Uh uh, but it seems like a typical Tesla, you know, you release your, your first batch and then it improves over time. Uh, I still wish they would include a little bit more safety instructions as to when and should you take over given the circumstance. But uh, yeah, I'm very keen to drive it. Looks like they've mm -hmm. changed some of the UI as well, around as well. So especially on Model 3, you get a much larger visual layout of what's going on here. Uh, and I think that's really super interesting. And yeah, I'd love to go for another ride in a car. Uh, the one that I you know, went for was in North Carolina, of course. The next time I'm back in North Carolina, which probably won't be long, I, think that I will just a few days uh, go for like ride. A, a big update coming that's going to make even even more improvements to what the, the beta testers have been seeing. So, uh, and I saw one of the one of the guys i believe it's james Locke. he he up did a, uploaded a video the other day and with no interventions uh just you know running to the store and back or something and uh, that's awesome who was it uh omar I, I forget what his uh yeah his real name's omar but he did a was it la to san francisco something like that like some some like a long trip like three interventions or maybe so the system when I drove it didn't work on highways. It was just normal autopilot. Uh, right, right, so I'm right. curious to see if that's still the case now. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's just for city driving. Uh, I don't believe they've unlocked it to highways. Although I totally could be wrong. Yeah, on roads like this, uh, you, you, it works. Uh, you know, this is what it's designed for. Uh -huh. I think I pushed it a little bit harder than I probably should have on the earlier system driving in a major downtown city environment, uh, really complicated streets in Raleigh, North Carolina. I think most of the driving on these roads that I experienced, yeah, it, would, it did just fine. Um, so yeah, it's it's fun to watch the rollout, fun to watch the improvement. Uh, and, and then we'll see, uh, you know, in, in terms of the data gathering, when the public will have access to this, and then um, how they're gonna communicate the use of the system to make sure people don't abuse you know, or, or just even understand the fact that they still need to pay attention when they're on, uh, you know, FSD beta. Right, FSD beta, yeah. Um, so, so we're right up against the clock here. I just want to mention one other story before we hit the road and enjoy the weekend and lots of turkey, think, uh, turkey leftovers. Um, Aptera opens pre-orders for its Paradigm series on de December 4th. So Aptera, uh, which is... Uh, Wingles Bird. So they put out this little teaser video, and that's kind of like the front end of the new car, and they're going to be showing that very soon and, and beginning pre-orders for the Paradigm. They have the Paradigm and the Paradigm Plus. Uh, and these are an interesting car uh, and a company. It originally kicked off, man, I think I remember watching this and seeing this all happen because I was a really big fan, and there was like a Aptera forum that I was a member of. and uh, So... Chris Anthony and Steve Fambro started this company, I believe with another gentleman, back in like 2006 or something. 
and they went for a few years. They had some uh, prototypes, and they then they hired a different CEO, and and, and things kind of fell apart. The wheels kind of came off after that. It's a th- I don't know if you have another shot of it, but it's basically it's a three wheel car. It's super aerodynamic, super efficient, and so like the car went away. Uh, the the co founders did different things for you know most of the last ten years or so, uh, but now they they've gotten back together, uh, Chris Anthony and and Steve Fambro, and they have the new the new Aptera, which it looks you know a lot like the old one, except it, it's got a lot more solar involved on it. And uh, it's got in-wheel motors this time around, I believe three in-wheel motors. So that's a little bit different approach. You know, at the, when it first came out, it was, there were so few electric vehicles like the, the Tesla Roadster and then maybe the Nissan Leaf and the Bolt, the Volt was coming. And this thing just kind of grabbed a lot of people's imaginations. Like a lot of people, you know, will look at that and think, yeah, how can I drive that on the road? It's kind of crazy. Um, but Kyle, real quickly, you like odd cars. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, and I, it doesn't speak to me like other odd cars. And I right. think the reason why is it's really well thought out, or at least seemingly well thought out. <laughs> I like weird cars where someone's given zero effort, and you're not sure if it's actually going to hold together when you make it there. Uh, right. so, uh, you know, my, my ultimate car, I always say this is a Morgan three wheeler because just getting to your destination <laughs> alive and without severe me- mechanical failure is a victory. And right. I feel like this is going to be too reliable for me. So that's just my guess. Okay. And I, I believe they call this like a never charge too. Cause you can get like, ideally, uh, was it like 40 miles of, of energy a day from, from that solar panel on the, on over the roof and in the back, uh, I mean, look, it'd be fun to try one out here because we have 330 days of sunshine here in Colorado. So it, it would actually be great. I only drive two miles a day to Starbucks and back, and uh, it would work fine. But I can't imagine pulling up the Starbucks drive through in this and having to open the door and get my drink out. And You know, is there room for a cup holder in there? I mean, uh, I, I'm sure there is. It's, That's uh, funny. It would be fun. I, I'm not, I don't dislike it. So that's, that's a little bit funny because the original one, there was like this whole thing about drive throughs and, and the windows have they rolled down. Right. Was, originally, I think they were just like slide back windows, which weren't sophisticated enough for some people. Uh, yeah. Dom, I was a fan of the, the original Aptera also and was following okay. it. And I tried to reserve one and they wouldn't let me because I didn't live in California. They were only taking reservations for people in California. This is back like 2008-ish when there was right. really, as you said, nothing available. Um, and But really, if you remember, do you remember what the downfall really was of Aptera? Do you, uh, besides the fact they ran out of money, but this is the reason why. They participated in the 2010 Automotive X Prize competition. Yeah. And you had to, in order to qualify, you had to have um, a vehicle that was a hundred mile per gallon equivalent. You had the vehicle had to have at least a hundred miles per gallon or or a hundred miles per gallon equivalent. And going into this competition, I think it was largely accepted that um, Aptera was going to win because they seemed like they were the most polished. Like the vehicle almost looked like it was ready for production, and you know uh, it was a ten million dollar prize, and that would have springboard uh, springboard more financing, and you know maybe they would have went to uh to production and unfortunately it just was not ready for prime time the the doors would open up whenever it made sharp turns and like um it it did it numerous times and like the driver almost fell out and then the brakes were would lock under hard braking the brakes were constantly locking up and you'd see smoke coming out of the tires and coming out of that people were like oof like like I guess this thing really is not nearly close to production. And that kind of put it into its spiral. Before that, it had a lot of uh, wind in its sails. And, and uh, there were a lot of people saying, hey, this this really could work. And, and they were getting funding. And then everything kind of dried up after that. Um, but uh, I love it. I think it's so cool. I'd love to drive one. Yeah, I think the door opening thing really gave it a bit of a black eye. But, you know, it's, I think most of us understand that's, that's a, that. It's a minor engineering thing. Look, tweak, you know, kind of, I forget exactly. I remember there's a whole d- big deal about it, though. You're right. Yeah, it just, it gave a bad impression that they weren't yeah. ready for prime time. It wasn't just the door. It was just that, 
look, they presented this vehicle like here we are, here's the Aptera. And it just looked like it was like cobbled together in someone's garage. The doors were opening, the brakes were locking up and the other vehicles that were in competition with them, this wasn't happening to those vehicles. Right. And they were supposed to be inferior. So I think that's that hurt funding and so forth and so on. All right. I like that whole XPRIZE thing. That was an interesting part of like American automotive history that remember Zap was involved. I forget who the actual winner was. I can kind of picture, but then it didn't go anywhere afterwards. Like this, yeah. it seemed like the, for a couple of years it had some energy, but then, it, you know, I think everyone pretty much, it all died out. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our show. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section below, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom Malogny is at Tomalog. Uh, Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. And Kyle Connor is at out of spec i'm dominic underscore y click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications and we'll see you all again next week ciao